Okay, I will be brief, but uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Carolyn Hislop and Jeremy Ward from the Canadian Canoe Museum. I can't think of a better opportunity for us to hear about this because uh, as they'll discuss, there's tremendously exciting things. And this is really just such an amazing treasure for Canada. Uh, I, I have some, I have a personal connection because I was a camper at Camp Candelor <laughs> where the museum got its start under the leadership of Kirk Whipper. And I, I'll just very briefly, you don't want to hear from me, but I have two reminiscences. One is paddling in a big West Coast dugout that they put in the lake. And it's in your collection. I just don't know which one it is. Oh and my you, God. You know, Tom. Get a first-hand appreciation for that. <laughs> it was unbelievable. But the other thing, is, and this will allow you to comment on how far the museum has come. It was a beautiful log building at the camp. But as you're approaching it by the front door, there was 20 or 30 fire buckets filled with water. <laughs> I don't know if you have a picture of that. But I, you probably, as a curator and a director, you don't even want to think about this. I, no. I won't go into what the fire buckets were there for. It's, it's uh, completely obvious. But I suspect uh, that was one of the... Anyway, it was a great move from Candelar to Peterborough. That was phenomenal. And what we're going to hear now is the next step, which will be every bit as phenomenal. I just think it's wonderful that the work that's going on, but we're gonna hear all about it. So let me introduce our two speakers. Carolyn began her career with the Canoe Museum in 2002. She's had many roles, including education coordinator, public programs manager, director of operations and general manager. She earned a bachelor of education from Queens University outdoor and experiential education program and a Bachelor of Kinesiology from McMaster University. And prior to joining the museum, she's held positions at Camp Bortha, Outward Band Bound Canada, Canada World Youth, Quetico Foundation, and the Blue Water District School Board. And she is an ORCA certified instructor, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, Jeremy, uh, he started as a volunteer, but joined the staff of the Kinney Museum in 1997. He had previously coordinated field school, field school for Trent University in the Nunavut community of Pangnertung and has and undertook at various times cabinet making, birch bark canoe building, and archaeological work in Greece. Uh, graduate, of Trent, graduate of Trent University's Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies programs, Jeremy has curated more than 10 exhibits for the museum. And his journey also includes traditional canoe museum, or sorry, traditional canoe building, cabinet make, making and research and feature, being featured in documentaries for Discovery Channel, BBC, and The Nature of Things. And his resume also includes researching and creating a 36 foot, foot canoe, which is a beautiful uh, achievement. So let me end it there and we'll get on with the show. So I'll turn it over to Jeremy and Carolyn. Thanks again. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing your, what you have to tell us. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> wow, that's a, um, those are great memories to start actually, I think our presentation because it positions us on a long journey. Uh, and we've lately been calling it um, <clears throat> the final portage. The museum has had uh, two major chapters in its life, one at a summer camp with fire buckets outside of a <laughs> unique uh, one of a kind, one of a kind collection um, in, in a log cabin uh, by a lake. Lately at a um, uh, outboard motor factory and we're getting very close to opening a new museum next summer and we're here to tell, bring you some great new materials all about it. Carolyn's joining us, I think, from Quebec, are you, on uh, Mont Saint-Anne somewhere? Oui, yes, I am. And I am just back from a couple days winter camping and great to be with you. So we have some brilliant new materials here to bring to you uh, since our last update, <clears throat> including uh, some deeper views of the site plan, a fly through the museum, a, a quick glimpse at some of the exhibits. We don't have enough time tonight to get into the exhibits uh, in any great detail. And also, uh, uh, I, I think a, a hand out to this community. We see you as our community, and we hope you see us as your community uh, as a way for you to get involved. And so 
if I can, I'm just going to bring up uh, some uh, <clears throat> a view to our new home. This is an overview. Mm. Can, you, can you see that clearly? Yeah, that looks good, Jeremy. Well, Carolyn, why don't you uh, why don't you hop in? Just give us a, a high level about the the project, where we are, and our timelines, and then launch us on the site. Thank you, Jeremy, and hello, everybody. Thank you for letting Hi. us. Um, sit in on your AGM and, and get the scoop on where things are at. It sounds like it actually has been an incredible year. It's not been an easy year for a lot of organizations. And so um, for everybody here to have really focused their ed energies on things they can control, um, uh, commend everybody on the team. Sounds like you guys are doing great work. Um, on our side of things, things that we can control, we've been really excited with the progress. Um, so, um, just looking at this photo, so this is a, a, a shot of the landscape plan for our new site. And so this is a five acre waterfront site in Peterborough. And just this past October, so a couple months ago, we started construction on this site. And so that was one of those, I think when we were back, when we were back with you last year, um, we were talking about sort of leading up to this moment and hoping we'd get there and, and we have finally reached that incredible milestone to start construction and right now we've got foundation work all happening on the property right now so we are um, well underway um, which is you know there's all kinds of other work that we are going to share with you just to sort of build on some of the excitement and also to give you a bit of an inside scoop into what's happening behind the scenes that not, you know, you just aren't gonna see it on the website or on social media or stuff like that. So this is, um, so this is uh, the five acre site, as I was saying, um, many of you saw renderings, I think last year. And so um, Jeremy, you've got the cursor. Um, and so I just want you to hover over the Trans Canada Trail so one of the features that we love about this property, and we purchased this from the city of Peterborough, um, is that it has the Trans Canada Trail bisecting the property. Sorry. So we have sort of, whoop. Yeah, sorry about that. There we are. <clears throat> yeah, so we've got the trail of the gray line closest to the water. We've got a really naturalized waterfront. So it's great for programming. Um, we are building some incredible docks and these will be floating docks that'll come in and out seasonally, but will be excellent for both big canoe programming, which is where Jeremy's cursor just was, so that we'll have a couple of big canoes on those docks on the, in the creek side. And then the T dock at the, um, and this is sort of the western point of the whole property. Um, which is lovely because everybody knows what a west facing property looks like. Those are pretty lovely uh, sunset views that we're gonna have from sitting on the end of that dock, looking out across the lake. Um, and so there's lots of canoe provisions. Over on the left is Beavermead Park. This is a municipal park um, that has beach volleyball nets. It has a beach for swimming. Um, it's certainly got its own, um, like its own energy to it, which is great. We're tapping into this recreational side of, of the city of Peterborough. There's actually a campground um, that's run by the Conservation Authority. And so tent trailers and tents are in that campground. It's, um, it's a pretty urban campground, not something that I think most of us are, are, would be looking for, but it's, it's great. Um, for introducing people to, to sort of front country camping. Um, across the road uh, that runs north south is all of the municipal parking. Um, and so I think folks know that we're a, we are ourselves a not for profit charitable organization. We're privately run. Um, we, we're doing this project with lots of support. We have all four levels, levels of government involved and the city of Peterborough is um, one, of our, one of our partners and they're funding, helping to fund part of the project. And they're also supporting this project by providing municipal parking. Um, and so across the lot so that we didn't have to build the parking on this beautiful site and sort of protect 
all of the outdoor areas so that we can actually have um, outdoor programming right out the back door of the canoe museum. So we're building a canoe house. Um, that's that yellow square closest to the Trans Canada Trail. All the pathways and walkways, even down to the dock are gonna be accessible um, so that anybody with mobility issues can be quickly, easily accessing the entire site that actually the docks are gonna have an accessible um, uh, provision, yep, right under the cursor there for accessible canoe and kayak launching. Um, we've got a, from on the environmental side of things, this is a really sensitive site. Um, a lot of it is in the floodplain. So we're thinking a lot about stormwater management, thinking about, um, uh, we've done a big removal of a lot of um, invasive species. There's a, and a lot of dead and dying uh, white ash have been taken down from the property. And so we'll be replanting with a, with a full um, master plan that focuses on increasing the diversity, uh, like the biological diversity of, of the plants and the shrubs and the trees on the property. And also thinking a lot about um, water management through those plantings. And then of course, the next layer is making sure that there's really good teaching opportunities through those plants and trees that are being planted. There's a campfire ring, of course, outside, and we've got some provisions for a marquee tent so that we can have outdoor events. Um, there's a lot of other features on this property, but we're really excited how it's coming together um, because it is something that's, it's going, certainly the museum as, as, a, as a learning place is going to transform the experience for visitors, but having an outdoor campus, an outdoor space for people to extend their stay, to get outside, to get off that bus that they've come from the Toronto area in and get into the visit the museum and then get outside and go for a paddle or just enjoy a cup of coffee on the grounds and just sort of enjoy being in a natural space. And I think this is gonna be a really, really unique offering for visitors coming in. Jeremy, would you like to pick it up from there? I'd love to. So Other have, updates? <clears throat> well, we're going to uh, bring to you now something that we haven't uh, brought publicly yet. This is very exciting. And this is lifted off of our architectural drawings. This is a fly through, it's a six minute uh, fly through that Carolyn and I are going to uh, take you on um, and I'm going to fire it up now and then we can make a few stops along the way. Oh, you know what? I, Tom and uh, Gary, you're going to kill me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, no, no, it was optimized. There we are. Good, good, good. Okay. Back on the game. <clears throat> Coming across from the from Ashburnham Drive into the parking lot, approaching the museum. And you can see that as we approach, there are three versions of the Canoe Museum's name. This speaks to the fact that all signage and wayfinding at the Canoe Museum is in English, French, and Michisagi dialect of Anishinaabe Moen, the, uh, the local dialect here on uh, the uh, <coughs> Treaty 20 Nations and Williams Treaties. So, Gete Chiman Wugumik, Canadian Canoe Museum, Musee Canadzin Canoe. As we approach the museum, yes, that's Corten. What does that mean, Jeremy? Uh, well, it, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a version still being worked. Thank you for asking. It's a, still being worked by Elders and Ann Taylor uh, and Mary Simons at Curve Lake First Nation, who are um, consulting on uh, Michisagi uh, language in the museum. And uh, this version means Old Canoe House. Uh, and I think it's still in draft form, but uh, we'll see where they where the elders land. As we approach inside, uh, Carolyn mentioned the dead and dying ash trees on the property, and there were quite a lot of them. And as we know, everywhere in Canada, white ash is, is just being obliterated by the emerald ash borer. And so we've milled uh, 20 of the logs, beautiful white ash logs, and uh, we're using them for uh, architectural purposes or for you know these sort of oh sorry um, for these these statement purposes here we we're drawing the, the wood as we speak 
Uh, it's beautiful ash <clears throat> for what it's worth, the poor, poor trees. We've also set aside some for canoe gunnels and had it milled to uh, 17 foot lengths. Coming into the atrium, this is really a wow moment. And I'm just gonna back up just a couple feet here. So you get that first peak, which takes you into this space um, and you can take in all of the mass timber. This is, uh, this is spruce from northern Quebec uh, near Shibugamu. The Nordzik is a Canadian company producing mass timber and cross laminated timber panels. And this whole end of the building is a celebration, I think, of craftsmanship and, and, and the natural materials palette that, um, you know, the canoe finds in its origins. This is an area that's going to be well uh, enhanced by canoes uh, that are brought out here and suspended in a space. And it's really a celebration area. It's a gathering space. This is the atrium, the reception area. Straight ahead of us is the front desk. The museum um, works uh, through the generous support of about 160 volunteers, many who will work down at this space. Uh, new to the museum, and we're going to revisit it on the way back, is a cafe on the right. But um, one, of, uh, one of our favorite features here, and I, I should really give credit to Carolyn, who's been the champion of this the entire time, is a working fireplace here at the museum. That authenticity of stepping, off the, stepping out of your car off the highway, out of a bus, um, coming into the museum, and there's that actual fireplace insert. Uh, in this place, it's not gas. It's um, and, it, and and indeed we're we're still working with some offcuts of the ash logs too from this property for for some time as well. Um, Tom, you mentioned your youth at Kanawha Muse at Camp Candelor, and we also have the original sign from the the humble beginnings of this museum's remarkable collection hanging here uh, to to show the origins of this museum. It's always celebrated where it comes from as an idea, as a moment of inspiration. And uh, even though here we are, we are opening now. <clears throat> it's a beautiful uh, facility on this campus uh, for the public as an offering. Uh, we, we like to be reminded of where this came from. There's a fireplace on the other side here too, serving the outdoors. Indoor outdoor was really always our goal. Uh, you know, the canoe is never far from that. Uh, in fact, spend, likes to spend most of its times outdoors. I'm delighted to hear that you were paddling some canoes that are considered artifacts in the museum's collection. Uh, <laughs> those, were, those were different days. Uh, you're not the first to tell me that too. And I think, my gosh, uh, many lives were changed by those early years uh, at that summer camp, but we do treat them differently now. We're gonna visit this room on the left in a moment. This is our canoe building studio, artisan studio, and we're actually gonna go into it. But I wanna take you past the public washrooms here on the ground floor into the collection hall. Um, this was recently championed by a uh, family foundation in Western Canada. And this is a 20,000 square foot uh, storage hall uh, where we can bring collection hall where we bring the public in for guided tours. Now there are no canoes positioned on the cantilevered racking yet, but every rack arm um, has been designated a space for a canoe that's coming over. Uh, and in fact, there's room for growth. <clears throat> uh, and we're soon to begin carrying um, 550 canoes into this room and another 100 upstairs. So it's, it's, a, it's a big venture. Now leaving the collection hall, we're coming into the artisan studio, canoe building studio. And this is a great space, a maker space. You know, the canoe culture is never, canoe and kayak cultures are never too far away from the, the, the making traditions, the craftsmanship, the, the technology of, of, of what they are, uh, whether this is ancient uh, traditions or, or, or co contemporary state of the art. And so we want to celebrate them all here at the Canoe Museum so that whether we're bringing in canoe builders and residents or we're teaching uh, black, canoe, black cherry canoe paddle workshops in this space, mm -hmm. those garage doors there let us take, do a kayak building course and take the, the kayaks outside to sand them down and varnish before they come back in. These big gray boxes here, these are the big stationary tools for the woodworking shop. So this is table saws, band saws, drill presses, thickness sanders, you name it. Uh, in order to support the programming happening in the other area. That's a quick peek into the storage room. Hmm. <clears throat> this pipe sticking out of the wall, that's a mistake. <laughs> that's just a clash from the, uh, the BIM modeling or the, uh, the architectural, it's, it's, it no longer is there. It looks like a chin up bar, but it's, uh, it was not intentional. Now leaving the artisan studio, 
Over the open hmm. doors in this, we're heading upstairs. Just want to take a quick peek at the retail space. And this is a very modular, flexible space that takes advantage of this sort of point position here. Remember, everything that's sort of orangish colored is, is wood, as is this uh, the wood feature wall on the right. We're climbing upstairs. It's a long way up because of the, the height and volume of that collection center. So we had to push up the second floor in order to make sure the collection all fit. Um, it, was, it was less expensive to do that and we couldn't spread the building any further than we had. And so the architects, I, I'm so grateful for a lot of the moments they've created in this project. And this is one of them. This is on your way up. If you're taking the stairs, you get the second point view into the collection hall. You can see the top of my bald head as I'm down there working. But uh, as you're coming up here, Finally, this is an area that we call the lookout. And uh, this lets on to the atrium area we were just at here. Down at the this atrium area, Jeremy, and for those of you who are there just seeing it for the first time, this is gonna do double duty. Most of these spaces are, are serving double, if not triple duty. So this is certainly reception, visitor services, the cafe, but it's also an event space. So it's an opportunity for us to hold, perhaps if we get back to holding AGMs in person, our AGM mm -hmm. could be held in this space. Um, we'll be able to host receptions and corporate events in this area after hours, um, exhibit openings, you name it. It becomes this flexible dynamic space that where we can, we can share it with the community. And the same with that artisan, the canoe building studio, artisan studio that Jeremy was going through. That's actually a pretty cool spot for like a, you know, a making like a workshop, artisan workshop perhaps, and a beer pairing or a scotch tasting um, and trying to really, really expand the offerings that the canoe museum is gonna be putting forward as events and workshops going forward out of this space. Um, there's just, there's a lot more opportunities in some of the areas. Mm. Sorry, I had to interrupt you there, Jeremy. No, nice Go on, nice talk about your beautiful canoe hoist. Yeah, this is one of my <laughs> moments here. Um, see that red canoe there? So this is a museum that currently caring for about 650 canoes, canoes and kayaks with an exhibition hall on the second floor and a collection hall on the ground floor. And <laughs> every square inch in this building very different than the lift lock project that uh, we were originally imagining. I think that we've found every square inch of this building can serve double or triple duty. And so as Carolyn was saying that that atrium area down below that is our uh, cafe reception area gathering space for coach tours and school buses. Uh, after hours events rental beer and wine tastings. Yes, of course. And it also becomes an elevating space when we are changing exhibits. The collection hall is downstairs, the exhibits are upstairs. And so we have this two ton hoist on the swing boom here that's built into the building so that we're not, um, we're not hiring in special services mm -hmm. to make this happen. Uh, we would do it of course with flags and, and um, safety harnesses and clear, cleared for action. But uh, it was absolutely fundamental that the museum needs to be able to meet all its needs internally, operationally with this facility. And I love the kind of, just the, the working, uh, the, I don't wanna say working class, but the functionality of this, this it's, a, it's a clear gesture to just everything that the museum does and, and the sort of hands-on application of, of canoe people, canoe, canoeing it's gonna people. It's gonna be a cool, t it, I mean, it's part of just showing the work that's involved. Yeah. Not yeah. hiding it. It's, uh... And going on to two floors, allowed us also to, well, it, 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 Carolyn mentioned the floodplain condition on uh, much of the site, but it also allowed us to maximize the outdoor campus and minimize the footprint of the building, which was so important. It's a five acre site. And we wanted to make this as much of an outdoor experience as an indoor. This is a quick peek into the exhibition hall. Um, the, the colors are changed. This was just um, lifted in from our exhibit designers that we're working with. Um, so you can just get a sense of it here, but it's going to be a pretty fabulous space. This is another 20,000 square foot volume, also with a temporary exhibit zone right there. And we're going to I think turn Jeremy around. said it out in front, but this is very much a working model that the architects use to, to detect clashes. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of fun because they can render it 
you know, and, and give us a copy of it. And so we shared this with our board to give them a sense of how the building's coming together. This space has changed a lot. So this is our um, events and education room. So a lot of our school programs, we have about over 5,000, this is pre-COVID, but 5,000 kids that come through the museum on, on school directed field trips. And I'm sure we're gonna get back to that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we've also made sure that the space is utilized for events as well. And so what we're, that window that you're looking out, that faces west. So that looks out over the lake. Um, and what we've just decided as the board is they've added on an upper deck to this room. So we can actually step outside and look out over the lake 25 feet up and it's about an 800 square foot deck that's been put on and it's gonna, you know, do multiple things. It's gonna be the landing that we're gonna use to crane up um, or lift up all of the canoes that are gonna have to come into the exhibit hall when we begin our move in. But it's a, it is a gonna be a really beautiful offering to be able to hop outside um, as part of your event and, and go check out the lake and great for school kids in our summer camps to be able to leave the building without have um through that back door as well without having to go all the way through the main building you might mention got a prep kitchen yeah that was a prep kitchen because we want to make sure local caterers are utilized by our clients rather than rather than um, us trying to do everything we've got great food in peterborough and a great food culture so we want to make sure that that's part of it um yeah. this room uh will seat 160 at banquet and 190 at uh conference setting so again amplifying what carolyn was saying downstairs for events uh this will be an amazing space that has an indoor outdoor offering and then we can use that downstairs area as a pre-function when the conference is over and it's time to uh grab a snack and a cocktail and then sit down to a dinner back in the same space Coming back out into the warmth of the uh, the cross laminated timbers, all of this northern Quebec uh, softwood here. This is our research and knowledge center. This is our archive, our reading room. We have an amazing collection of books uh, that was vastly enhanced by George Liste's family, um, sixteen thousand titles, and uh, so there isn't nearly enough room for them on these shelves. I can tell you that. But this is um, a great reading room with the museum's uh, reference materials. And then we also have rare books and archival storage uh, on this door on the right. I should mention that the collection hall, the exhibits hall, in fact, the whole facility, but to very close controls, the collection hall, exhibits hall, and this room on the right are uh, designed to class A uh, museum environment control standards. And so that um, caring for these rare books uh, and archival materials, film, photographs, et cetera. Uh, there's compact mobile racking in this little door behind the right. And on the left is an area where we can sit down and do interviews. Uh, and this is for capturing oral histories, caring for oral stories. Um, so both the written records and then the oral tradition as well uh, in this space. I mean, this helps the museum and the broader community understand this incredible collection and, and all, all it is that we all do. Here we are stepping into the administration area. This has changed a great deal since this rendering mm -hmm. was generated, but uh, now you're oh, into no. the, the back of house. Uh, mm -hmm. This is definitely a hybrid work model. Um, mm -hmm. Many of the staff, uh, Carolyn, you've, uh, you're, well, you're, you're well planning for, are gonna continue to be on a sometimes in, sometimes not, sometimes always working from home. Uh, we are all adapting, aren't we? And so uh, modular workplaces, um, hot desking, and then a few uh, stationary places as well. A couple of things with the library and archive space that has always been really difficult to make accessible for the public or any visiting mm -hmm. researchers. And one of the core principles of creating that was that we could, we, we will be able to make it publicly accessible. So it can be used um, by the visiting public, by researchers. And so it's been woo, really important to have that front and center. 
Jeremy's going to hang a lot more canoes in this atrium, I'm oh, told. Yeah. Yeah, and be, what's showing be. here? <laughs> 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 They're going to be hung everywhere. Uh, I would say so. Yeah. Um, so with <clears throat> construction start, just while you pull that up, Jeremy, construction started. Um, we've also, so you, you get, Jeremy's going to talk a little bit about the exhibits. The exhibits, we began the exhibit development last year. We are rapidly moving towards the end of our detailed design phase, which should give us all the, the layouts and the elevations that we need to go into actually building them. Um, and the, um, in addition to the exhibits, uh, there's been quite a lot of work um, on the fundraising side of things as well. And we've also started getting the collection ready for move. There you go. There's the exhibits as they've sort of been laid out. <clears throat> yeah, um, a collection of over 650 canoes moving, Car Carolyn, you mentioned. And we're now past 340 <laughs> that have been condition reported, cleaned, documented, cataloged, and bagged, uh, ready for their cradles uh, that'll carry them to the new museum. We're going to come back to that in a sec. So <clears throat> this I could probably spend the next four hours of your life just touch, sc scratching the surface on. These are our exhibits and, and uh, we started a bit late here. So I'm going to keep this really high level. This is a super high rollerblades tour. There are six uh, long-term exhibits in this zone and the seventh in the upper right is our temporary exhibit hall. You're coming in from the right. So do you remember when we were doing our fly through, you came into it and it was suddenly black and white and you were looking uh, <clears throat> at this room. That's where we were standing and we were looking ahead at this swirl of canoes. This is really a wow moment. This is your introduction to the exhibits hall. Uh, and this is um, a few takeaways, key takeaways to this is, is just how we are all connected by water and the canoe through the crazy magical lens that the museum has to work with as, as, its, as its theme, as its muse, um, we find those connections. So you can see a hydrological map of North America. Uh, it's going to be a little different than that, but this is 23 feet across and uh, very detailed uh, married rivers and uh, lakes across this continent without the geopolitical boundaries, which is always such an effective way, teaching tool to understand really why the canoe and kayak uh, mean so much in this landscape here. Although we do expand uh, around the globe elsewhere in the exhibits. We are connected by water um, and whether waters uh, rise at their headwaters or at the sea is, is an, a debate, I suppose, but uh, the Canoe Museum is privileged to be on Nogo Jiwanong on uh, Treaty 20 Michisagi territories. And so we start your journey there, uh, but the museum follows the canoe where it leads. And in the swirl around, you'll see canoes of all traditions, cultures um, and generations uh, from a battered old Grumman to a carbon fiber to a birch bark canoe from uh, Curve Lake First Nation. Um, that'll lead us into zone two called All My Relations. And this explores the communities of origins of the canoe and kayak around the world. Um, whether it's Pacific Northwest here on the, uh, the lower right, that of course these are often very big, uh, not the one you were paddling uh, at, at Camp Candle or Tom, you'll see that later on, uh, if I'm not to be mistaken. There's a, uh, there, there, the arc of birch bark canoes from New England to Alaska here in the middle, Inuit skin on frame technology from Greenland to Alaska. And then uh, canoes from around the world, from, uh, from Africa, from Cameroon and Kenya, all the way to Thailand and Oceania uh, and, and points in between through the Americas. And then the colorful arc here at the lower left, these are communities of practice, including um, expedition paddlers, people who are forming new communities in, in, in the modern era of all backgrounds. Uh, who are, are, are de developing deep relationships with the environment and with each other through paddling, through, whether it's through summer camps, et cetera, or expedition paddling. Zone three, connected by canoe. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, probably the most chronological of the exhibit zones here, otherwise all thematically explored. And this takes us through the arc of um, trade and relations um, in pre-contact times into the fur trade. And this is our 19th century Hudson Bay Company uh, fur trade post from Mitch Picotton on Lake Superior. 
uh, <clears throat> and some very difficult stories uh, and during the colonization, the, the decades of colonization, of course, uh, taking us through scientific expeditions to the Arctic and residential schools and um, <clears throat> pathways and new healing as we, oh, I should clear off my uh, annotation tools. So this is a, uh, an exploration of relationships, changing relationships over the last centuries with the arrival of Europeans and interconnected uh, interdependencies in the early period. And then those changing relationships bringing us right up to contemporary voices today, reflecting upon uh, those experiences and the healing that is happening now. If we jump under the big long canoe, this is zone five. This is called pushing the limits and how the act of paddling, canoeing or kayaking um, can push us beyond those limits. It, it poses some risk, but through those confronting those uh, limitations, we can often find our full potential. And this is an exhibit zone that explores some truly remarkable potentials. Uh, this is the, the growth of competitive paddling uh, from summer regattas to the Olympic sport and international canoe and kayak traditions today, uh, Northwest Coast racing traditions um, on the Pacific Rim. And then also expedition paddling here under the red canoe. Here we see a number of long distance paddling uh, stories shared out. Oriana that paddled from Winnipeg to Belém, Brazil. Greg and Suzanne Brown, who paddled across the country and then pa later paddled from their home on Georgian Bay up to Ngava Peninsula. And then at this blue canoe, we take a, a, a very meaningful moment here to understand risk um, and, and the incredible burden of risk and risk management uh, and the, the, the growth in the industry of canoe expedition and competencies over the last 50 years <clears throat> and people whose lives have been dedicated to building that co those competencies with others. Zone six, up, upper left here, this is called inspiration. And this is a uh, very fresh and contemporary perspectives looking at people whose lives have been propelled through their art, through their activity, through their energy to connect with the environment and to share that with others, uh, whether it's through cultural tradition and transmission or through activism and protecting waterways. Uh, we have some great photo ops and, and uh, stories, uh, videos being shared through here. <clears throat> Gordon Lightfoot, uh, his canoe story is being shared under that yellow canoe, of course, um, connecting with the environment was a key uh, balance to life on tour for Gordon. Zone four here, this is uh, design and ingenuity. This is the how it's made stuff. And this is where you get your hands dirty on how traditions of all backgrounds uh, related to canoe and kayak traditions. Um, just a celebration of the brilliance of engineering behind them, whether ancient traditions or also some of the most uh, cutting edge as well when we're looking at carbon. Kevlar, polyester lamps, all those, but also skin on frame, birch bark, and, and some great interactives. In zone seven, the last one, the temporary, this will change yearly, uh, but this really gives us the moment to uh, tell the story, the remarkable story of this museum that it's been on for the last 65 years since it was at a summer camp. And, uh, <clears throat> um, and then at its years in an in a outboard motor factory, and then the, the pivot that we've made to arrive at this uh, incredible new home and to welcome all of our community to it. Oh, there we go. So I'm mindful of the time and uh, we just have one last little uh, piece we'd love to just share with you. I'll make sure there's some time for questions. Yeah. Um, and a bit of the context behind this is um, we, Right after we broke ground, uh, we launched a, a campaign that was directed mostly at, at the sort of the general public, at everybody and anybody that uh, wants to get involved in helping the Canoe Museum. But they might not be a $500,000 donor. They might be somebody who has 50 bucks, 100 bucks in their pocket, maybe a grand, and they're looking to support a really meaningful part of this project and we came up with the idea of, of really utilizing the moving of the collection as the focal point of this campaign and this is um, 
So this is what we're gonna show you, which we launched with this video. Some maybe have seen it, but we wanted to give people a behind the scenes what's involved in moving this collection because it's incredible. So when we finish it, we'll just talk a little bit about where we are with the overall campaign and what our schedule looks like over the next year. Here we go. What a journey the Canadian Canoe Museum is on. We are building a brand new home for our one-of-a-kind collection of over 600 canoes, kayaks, and paddled watercraft. We are so close. We have an amazing new site on the water's edge in Peterborough. The construction of our beautiful new museum has already begun and development of our new exhibitions is well underway. We are standing in the heart of the Canadian Canoe Museum, surrounded by hundreds of canoes, kayaks and paddled watercraft from across Canada and indeed around the world. This space is not normally open to the public and this is where an incredible project is just getting underway. As you can imagine, moving a collection of this size is no small feat. If we gathered all of these vessels and line them up nose to tail or bow to stern, they would stretch more than three kilometers long. A collection like this is an exquisite portrait of our relationship, ancient and enduring today, of our relationship to the environment and to its waters. Now, to prepare for this move, each object needs to be cleaned, documented, fitted with a pallet for transportation and storage, quarantined and inspected. And this is where you come in. By sponsoring the move of a canoe or a kayak or a paddle, you're not just moving an object, you're moving its stories and ensuring that the knowledge that it holds will be shared for generations to come. But what a gift that is. We are on our final portage to the water's edge. This is a unique opportunity for you to learn more and get involved in this incredible project. Help us move the collection. Visit canoemuseum.ca slash move to learn more and to sponsor a canoe, a kayak, or a paddle today. So the, um, so we are working to finish our $40 million campaign by the time we open. And that's, and then it's a huge lift, you guys. <laughs> like it's a huge lift, no doubt about it. We spent a lot of time um, thinking about how we're gonna raise those funds and uh, those funds and applying to grants and talking to donors. But I'm glad to say to you tonight, and this is, um, we're just over 87% raised on that 40 million. Um, so we, we have a ways to go still, um, but we are the closest we've been in such a long time. And we are sort of, it's, it's within sight and we're working to get this all raised before June of next year. So um, we open June, we're actually aiming to open on June 26th, National Canoe Day. Um, and with the goal of having a really big grand opening event on July 1st, 2023, and you're all invited, one or the other, or all, I hope you'll be there. And, um, and so we do want to, the board is really keen to make sure that the full funds, all the capital is raised before we, we get this, we get this, uh, place operating. And so that's our plan and this public phase campaign of Move the Collection is part of it. So if there is anything that you can find yourself, um, if you would like to get involved, if you know people that you think might wanna get involved um, and support this project in any way, please, everything's online and send them our way. It's a great, it's a really great effort. There's really good people involved and um, and we hope that we hope that our folks here can can be part of it. So that's my that's it. I open it up. Questions? We're an open book most of the time, so fire at us whatever you got. Well, congratulations! I mean, it's an incredible project and very exciting. Uh, let me just one question I had was: 
have you had have you figured it all out for yourself how to move a whole collection of sort of a unique collection or are there things that you've drawn on to inform the process because i think mu sounds like museum skills have been sort of been very exacting to try and get this right and the, given the fragility and the diversity and the sort of odd shapes and everything <clears throat> yeah that's a that's a great question so as i mentioned in that little short this is three kilometers more than actually of canoes and kayaks you know we're doing this project uh with a different procurement model called integrated project delivery which brings us uh onto the same uh, working platform with the architects, the mechanical, electrical designers, all of the conservation. We are we all have skin in the game. We share the profit and risk. <clears throat> it's very different. It's a real learning curve. And one thing that it really all did, on Zoom. All on Zoom. Yes, that's right. It's all uh, on Zoom. <laughs> yes, crazy. So sorry. What what that's brought in is basically all parts of the project. We can use their expertise to bear and so one of the one of the really interesting developments was they took using their structural engineers and and uh, mechanical engineers uh, all the expertise they have to look at the cradle systems that we've been using because these canoes if we're going to fit them in a storage hall they need to be vertically stored we just can't sprawl it out on a single layer like we're doing now in this big abandoned warehouse. And so you cannot put canoes directly on the racks. These canoes need to be on individual cradles and supported, right? They're different than the, the Kevlar or, or aluminum canoes in my yard or the wooden ones where they they need to be in cradles. And so they're carried upright. They're, they're suspended on slings. These are on the sort of steel armature. And, and we've come up with their expertise, a brilliant design that um, that knocks down when it's not in use. So if a canoe goes on exhibit, then it can get collapsed or it can be adjusted to hold a longer canoe. So I, I, I found a lot of really interesting innovations brought to the project working with that team. Um, some things, you know, when you bring engineers in, they tend to become belt and suspenders overbuilt, but uh, more than they need to be but there there's been a lot absolutely a lot of a lot of careful thought one of the most complicated things really is just to make sure because at the end of the day when you're giving a tour having canoes and kayaks grouped by construction just makes the most sense whether it's for tour or for curatorial collection management reasons it helps us know we'll find it in the wood canvas canoes we'll find it in the birch bark canoes and so on and so forth that's the one thing we know about every object in our collection is how it was made. So grouping them by that, but then also ensuring that they all fit. Um, <laughs> and that at the end of the day, when we're bringing in 14 canoes, a, you know, in an afternoon and placing them up, uh, we know exactly where they're going to go. It's becoming quite a choreographed dance. And Tom, these, um, these pallets that the canoes are going on, we're actually part of the work that you saw the folks doing in the video that is happening right now and it has we started it um last summer because we sort of mapped out i mean how many canoes can be prepped per day and we realized oh my god we need to get going um and so we started it last summer and the pallets everything's going to be built at the current canoe museum so that those canoes get palleted at the museum and then we actually just move them the canoes actually only get handled really once they get put on their pallets and then the pallets are what the whole moving system is focused on so we'll but lifting everything by pallet rather than than by canoe and um open roll like um open trailers uh, transport trucks some open trailers will be moving them it'll be it's going to be all over the map it's, it's this all starts, um, so we start the move in of the canoes and kayaks in January of next year, which, um, yeah, we're all a little bit wired to think about that. But and when do the doors close on Monaghan Road for visitors? Or have so, they no, they haven't yet. No. Um, so we're going to close them um, as late as we possibly can. But right now it looks like the latest we can keep them open until is Labor Day weekend. Mm -hmm. So we'll um, visits need to happen this summer. So July and August, 
if you want to have folks bring people by we'll be doing some closing events so mm. it's something if you really um if it's something that means a lot to you and you want to be involved in and part of the uh, part of the list that gets notifications either those will go out through our volunteer member newsletters but it'll also go to our general newsletter so if you're not on that right now if you're not sure you can follow up with Jeremy and myself. We'll make sure you get on it. Um, but we will be doing some big closing events, deconstructing the current museum as well, um, which is why we need to close in September. Um, we need to start taking the watercraft down that are in the current museum. What happens to the old exhibits? Well, they are not moving across uh, with us, Gary. So. Mm -hmm. um, pieces of them will be probably will find new homes at some of our closing ceremonies yeah yeah, yeah. not the artifacts uh including that 19th century <laughs> hudson bay company timber frame post that's actually being decon deconstructed next september and getting ready to move across but uh you know text panels benches um all that stuff yeah, yeah. graphics all those great graphic panels yeah one of the things i kind of enjoyed was um you know, various uh, people were focused on like Herb Pohl. He was a WCA oh, yeah. member for many years. Yeah, sure he was. Uh, you mentioned George. Um, you know, uh, what do you see envisioned for historical, you know, figures? Ah, well, George and Herb are both uh, featured in the new museum's exhibits. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have a spot in there. Both their canoes are, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, but the exhibits are going to be completely different. Uh, there'll yeah. a lot of, there'll be a, a lot of familiar faces, I think, uh, in the, these new museum exhibits. Now, is there a parking lot for canoes if you go to the yeah. Silver Bean? And because it would it be about a fifteen minute paddle from right yeah, with, a down? with a tailwind? Yeah, for 20, sure. Twenty minutes. Yeah. 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 We'll have yeah. Uh, we'll have canoe acts. You, you go ahead, Carolyn. No, we're just in the process of designing some of the site furniture. And so there'll be a couple of sets of canoe racks um, right off those docks. And I, we didn't talk about it, but there's also a soft landing, like a normal sort of gradual entry um, for those that want to land or launch um, in the water at a beach area. So we'll we'll have canoe racks up at the top of that bank as well. So, and you know, if you bring your own, I mean, it depends on how people feel. I mean, people can, if you wanna bring your own or you're happy to, we haven't figured out how to secure them yet, um, but uh, we'll get there. Mm. Yeah. It, might be, it might be like at the, at the gym, if you need a, a padlock for a locker and you can, Pick one up and there'll mm. just be chains on. Oh, we'll figure that out. <laughs> I think Mark, you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, I've been involved in some uh, Voyager canoe activities here in Sault Ste. Marie, and I've heard a little yeah. bit of gossip about kind of a rendezvous that might be or a brigade that might be happening. Is that uh, is that yeah. just gossip, or is there some truth to that? That's oh, oh. very promising. We've got, uh, yeah. yeah, it's coming across the wind that there's some brigade coming in from the east and the west, right, Carolyn? Yeah, I wonder who, which, um, which group you were, which group you're talking with, Mark? <laughs> um, I don't know if that's gossip. I think that might actually be happening. We've been told, um, oh gosh, who are we talking to? Ooh, uh, I can't remember Bruce, right now. Bruce Clark? Oh, Bruce Clark, yes, um, yeah. the Brigade Society. Yeah. Yes, this is, yeah. So you're not- Although we're you, not organizing it. No. So you got, you got we will be the recipients plate. of, but not yeah. organizing. We've yeah. got our plates full. But you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be distressed if a couple of, of big canoes showed up from the Sioux and Points West. Well, we'd that. like to know before yeah. they get there, make sure <laughs> the docks open. <laughs> <laughs> we'll lift our boats out of the way so that you've got something to land at but no wouldn't that be a great yeah oh my gosh this needs to be like we want this to feel like you know one of those big big sort of gatherings of 
of all the all the folks that are super passionate about about being in the water and, and celebrating Canadian culture, Canadian history. Well, it looks like a wonderful building. I, I was very impressed with the architecture. Mm, glad to hear that. We love it. I think it. it's gonna, yeah, we're, we're really happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we went into this, you know, in a, in a, you know, a different state of mind. We were very beginning just looking to truly find a, um, a home for a project that was, that had fallen apart at the lift lock with the contamination on the adjacent property. And so, you know, we had really clear, we had clear expectations that the architects needed to meet in terms of meeting our functional program, meeting the mission related work we needed to do. Um, and we set a, we sort of set a direction in terms of authenticity and, and showing um, you know, being comfortable with showing some of the, the working parts of the museum, like the canoe hoist and the workspaces. And um, they've totally run with it. It's so exciting. It's and there's so much pride. Like mm -hmm. this is, um, Jeremy mentioned the integrated project delivery model. That construction model is one thing that really makes sure that we're all aligned from a values point of view, we're very much focused on collaboration. But then we've also been able to um, procure, like to hire a lot of local trades and suppliers. Mm -hmm. And so, and so consultants, trades and suppliers are, I mean, we must be over 85% local right now. So there's this real sense of like pride and, mm -hmm. and wanting to keep like bringing value to the, to this project, which we're starting to really see that come through, which is great. There's limited funds. <laughs> and the price of steel is going nuts, but. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Naturally. Yeah. Well, At the old building be wood. <laughs> no, Steve? I'm uh, just wondering if is the old building going to be repurposed? Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to sell it. Um, and we're just in the process of um, working with our legal team and the city of Peterborough and the board in terms of what that what the sale is going to look like um, this it is an interesting it is a complex site of course it is because it has what isn't complex um, but it is a complex site it was the old outboard marine corporations manufacturing facilities so there's contamination on that site and it's also, we're also a municipal capital facility, which has its own, its own sort of nuances that we're working through. So the goal is to have the property <clears throat> sold by the time, at least sold. Um, and then um, ideally by the, by the time we're into the new museum. So Jeremy and I are managing two sites, which would be the goal. We'll see how we do with that. Yeah. Any other questions? So how tall is that exhibit space, that 20,000 square uh, foot space? On the second floor, uh, it is, t well, it, because it's a, it's a pitched roof, um, it, not symmetrical, so the ridge line is off-centered. It's about 25 feet to its very highest. And uh, if, you, if I can go with feet with you, I'm not very good at meters and millimeters which is really what Enough. engineers and, and architects work in um, but to better support the exhibits hall we've created an artificial ceiling which is this it's a pipe grid a metal um, matrix that's you know ten, nine feet square uh, that's floating at, at 16 feet above height so we have this suspended grid of steel that we can attach lighting to and hang canoes from and everything else because otherwise you end up uh, dropping everything down from this very high ceiling. It was really important for us to have a pitched roof, a sloped roof over the collection and the exhibits hall to shed water. Uh, we've lived now for 25 years with uh, flat roofs, flat wooden roofs over collection and exhibits and um, no more. I can, I can, I can never again. 
and never <laughs> again slopes, never slopes, ever slopes. again out, never out, again outside eaves troughs yes not in not <laughs> internal <laughs> a lot of lessons from our current building <laughs> Is there a, um, yeah. what, what were you thinking in terms of that roof ridge? Andy? What's that? What were you thinking in terms of the roof ridge, just thinking about the height of that space? Yeah, I didn't have, didn't yeah. have a, a feel for like how bit, high yeah. is your, this yeah. big space, what are we walking? But you've answered the question, which is, that okay. everything doesn't hang from the ceiling ceiling yeah. you've got this you know Perfect. big steel thing suspended yeah. and then other things hanging from it so it's like a big chandelier hanging in the it middle is. of the yeah. except it's a very big <laughs> chandelier but i yeah. love it you know i still have a fantasy of getting a de havilland beaver uh or a norse uh -huh. in there with a canoe strap to a float in which case i'd yeah. have to remove a section of that uh, you don't actually need one? the whole thing. You just need to buy you a float it. and a strut and a canoe and just have there it there. <laughs> like it's exactly. coming through the roof. No, I, I actually really <laughs> want to have one. Yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but remember in Oshawa, they used to have an airplane on a building when you go through Oshawa? Yes, I do remember yeah. that. So you just need a piece of that airplane. <laughs> All right. There you go, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, the one thing I like is the when you second floor and you go outside and there's a deck, mm. maximize that deck because everybody's going to be on that deck, right? There you go. Everybody Would goes. Would you make it deck. bigger, Gary? Make it bigger. Yeah, make I'll tell you bigger. why. I had a really small house, the first house, <laughs> and I extended my deck. We're always out on the deck mm. in the summer. Yeah. Nobody be in the building. Everybody's out on the deck. Why would you the deck that? was the social center of my first house in the summer. <laughs> it cost us more money. I'm going to stop oh. listening. <laughs> but Gary, the, that, that deck has a naming opportunity. So if... Yeah, uh... <laughs> yeah it does. <laughs> How if much it, will it cost us? <laughs> just a quarter million dollars. You should be oh, good. We're a little shy. <laughs> Barb, can you, can you squeeze yeah, that? Right. <laughs> Come on, guys. Come on. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh boy. Yeah, I I we 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 there's been a few parts of this project we've championed pretty hard. And mm. uh that upper deck, we just we were able to just approve it at the February board meeting mm -hmm. and uh been leading leading into that for a long time. It's gonna pay for itself in a it's just yeah. gonna yeah, be I such think a cool spot. It's gonna be popular. It's, yeah, it's, it's a no brainer, but it, it was hard to, I mean, we are really, we're really trying to really stick to, like really try to stick to the budget on this project. Mm -hmm. It is a fixed contract and, and with steel and all the other things, it's yeah. like, why would we add anything at this point? But right. it was, yeah. Anyways. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Been great. Uh, uh, one one quick one for me. Do you have new new things coming into the collection? I imagine you've really got mm -hmm. your hands full completely. But I'm wondering if you can't resist when you hear of some unique <laughs> thing that would just fit in somewhere to, in the story. Do you still uh, what's what's the rate of intake now? It must have slowed from. Uh, the yeah, early it, that's a great question. It really has, uh, and that's been not. Not to as much as I would like it to have. I was going to say, I say what about last year? <laughs> um, I work with a, a wonderful team, a collections committee. Um, but while the museum's profile is going up <laughs> and people, more and more people are hearing about it and, and some really interesting things come uh, out to our attention, we are also needing to both rationalize where everything is going in this new museum and have it fixing a budget to um, allocate for all of the things that it needs to get it from here to there and safely stored, including these steel cradles that we're making for each and every canoe. So we have almost turned off the tap temporarily for the transfer. Uh, I can say that we're still waiting for Max Finkelstein's uh, marathon canoe. A uh, beautiful cedar strip made by Les Crow, who's a canoeing legend locally, and a few other canoes. Uh, a really un an incredibly beautiful, but you wouldn't 
you wouldn't pass it by potentially at a, or you would pass it by at a flea market. Um, an Inuit kayak from Pond Inlet, 1950s, and, um, and it's canvas covered uh, in a time when the um, seal skins were still had a market value, you know, um, Greenpeace and, and other efforts in the conservation movement hadn't collapsed the seal industry. And so um, they, they were they were opting for canvas on the on the kayaks because they were selling the seal skins rather than wrapping their kayaks in them. And this was really at the twilight uh, decades. If you remember the old $2 bill that had a kayak seen on it, kayakers, the pink one, and there were, I think, seven kayakers in Pond Inlet. Um, this, is a, this is a contemporary to that, sort of at a moment in transition. And so this is early days. This was um, purchased from the community around that time. And uh, we still have some outreach to do with the community there in Pond to uh, to make the reconnection, but uh, I'm very excited about that that kayak and where it'll lead us. Great. Right. Well, let me thank you on behalf of the WCA. It's been great to hear about it, and uh, yes. hopefully, we'll all have a chance to uh, participate and, uh, and see the final result. Yeah. Once you there it's next over a summer. year, mm -hmm. so we'll see you in a year. <laughs> yeah, I put a link in the chat, uh, but anybody can go to the Canadian Museum. There's a link to donate to the existing building or the new building. Um, oh, there was a question here. Um, next AGM, I guess for the Canadian <laughs> Museum, Jeff. Oh, you're on. We've had it. Yeah, we we we've actually used the current uh, uh, can, Canoe Museum twice. Yes. So we had a, a self-guided tour. So oh. yeah. yeah, years ago. Yeah. AGM yeah. AGM 2024, Four. maybe, eh? Mm -hmm. Okay, whenever. Right? <laughs> yeah, we yeah. Be AGM that. 2024. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There you go. We might have uh, That'd be cool. uh, you know, like Luigi says, in person and uh, virtual simultaneously. Because one yeah, of the we're gonna have to, we're gonna, an AGM yeah, I think on Zoom, we get people, uh, well, an AGM or anything. Uh, we've had people from England on on workshops, uh, like if we do it on a Saturday. We've had people from the Yukon, uh, Minnesota. So it's amazing with the Zoom. It's broader because typically if you yeah. have it in person, it's in Toronto area somewhere. Uh, but, you know, that's the beauty of the Zoom. So maybe if you marry the two, um, yeah. So we'll take that as an invite. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I guess we're going to wrap it up. Yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Really lovely. It was wonderful to... presentation. Thank Great. you very much. For yeah, you. It was good. yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Okay. Take All care. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night.